Welcome to Business Radio X and to our program, Justice at Work, where we empower employees through education and information about workplace rights. This is Kathy Harrington Sullivan. I'm a partner with Barrett and Farahani. And on today's show, I'm going to be talking with attorney Adian Miller, also with Barrett and Farahani. Adian joined our firm earlier this year. And before she came to us, she worked in a variety of legal areas, including for the U.S. government, labor unions, nonprofits, a small plaintiff's firm, and a large defense firm. We are very glad to have her at Barrett and Farahani and happy to have her on today's show. So welcome, Adian. Thank you. Very much appreciate it. This show is one of a two-part series for September where we're going to bring you information about the Families First Coronavirus Response Act or the FFCRA. And in the later show that we'll, we'll push later this month, we'll also talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA and how that gets implicated in the pandemic and how that intertwines with the FFCRA. To start with, let's talk about the fact that on April 1st, the FFCRA went into effect. And let's, I guess, start by just telling everybody, giving everybody an overview of what the FFCRA does for employees. So the FFCRA basically works to provide employees with some new types of leave specific to the needs created by the COVID pandemic. Basically, we're looking at it's two types of leave that have gone into effect. We have the emergency paid sick leave act, and then we also have the emergency family and medical leave expansion act. And both of those went into place the April 1st, and they'll expire in December um, of this year, at the end of the year, basically. So for the emergency paid sick leave and expanded family medical leave, what's, what's the difference? How do I, as an employee, know you know, what am I asking for? What do I need? How do I know what I need? Because I know, you know, you and I look at these laws all the time and, and we're not sort of as daunted by all this legalese that is written into these laws, but, you know, they're probably not that accessible to an everyday person who's not an attorney and who wants to understand what their rights are. So what does it buy me if I'm, if I'm an employee? So if you're an employee and you find yourself in a COVID related situation, which I'll explain in a second, basically the first two weeks that you might need off from work would fall under the emergency paid sick leave back. So that's, that's where you might start. And so the, the sick leave basically applies to folks who are in one of six categories. And just to put them down briefly, the first category is if you're subject to any type of quarantine order, so by state or local level. Second, if you're advised to quarantine by a medical provider. Third, if you have COVID symptoms yourself and you're seeking a medical diagnosis. Fourth, if you're caring for an individual who might be subject to a quarantine. Fifth, if you're caring for a child whose place of care or school is closed due to COVID. Or six, if you have a condition similar to COVID. In those six categories, you're going to qualify for this emergency paid sick leave back. Now, those first three categories are folks who are basically who need leave to care for themselves. And so what that means is they're going to qualify for two weeks of leave paid out at hundred percent of their pay rate. The last three, if you're caring for somebody else who has COVID, you can still qualify for those two weeks of leave, but it's going to be capped at two thirds of your, your normal pay rate. Okay. And because employees obviously all make different incomes, is there any cap on the amount, the total amount that can be paid out under these paid leaves? Yeah. So if you're in the first three categories, if you're hundred percent, there's still a cap. I think it's 511 per day, uh, $5,110 total. And then if you're in the last three categories and you're looking at that two thirds pay, that is also capped at 200 a day or 2000 total. So there is going to be a limit on what you can claim. Okay. And that's just for the emergency paid sick leave, right? Because we're not, we're not into the expanded family medical leave just yet. Right. So that's just for EPS. EPS, I guess we could call it, right? (laughs) Okay. I guess the next thing, if I'm an employee, the next thing I want to know is how do I know if this law applies to me? I mean, are there exceptions, exclusions, um, exemptions, right? And there are. So so let's talk about that. So employees kind of know what to, to expect. I mean, if I'm a Walmart employee, can I get this? No. So the FFCRA does not apply to employers who have more than 500 employees. So your very large employers are not going to offer this. 
there's also an exemption for very small employers, if they have less than 50 employees, who claim that if they're trying to give you leave for for your child, if your child needs care due to COVID and and you're asking for leave for that, and that leave is going to drive them out of business, then they can also claim claim an exemption. So there are some limits to eligibility. Okay. And so just so we're clear on this small business exemption, that applies to both the paid sick leave and the expanded family medical leave, which I know we haven't gotten to yet, but it's, I think, important to highlight. It does cover both those things. So as a small employer, if if you're only asking me for the two weeks of paid sick leave, still, if I can meet that exemption, which we can get a little more into later on, if I can meet that exemption, then I can get out of paying that leave. But it's not quite as easy as having just the required number of employees, right? Right. So for the smaller employer exemption, there's a number of other tests that they're going to have to pass or meet in addition to qualify for that exemption. Let's talk about expanded family medical leave and what that looks like, and then we'll get into what it means for people. So this is the second type of leave that's available under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And it's like FMLA, which a lot of employees are familiar with, but it's basically a new reason to take FMLA. Um, And it's available to more employees. So what it is technically is you're still looking at your 12 weeks of pay, the way that, I mean, 12 weeks of leave that you can take off, but you can only take it off for providing child care or or, or care for children who aren't able to attend school due to COVID. Um, The first two weeks are not paid, but that's when you should hopefully be receiving your emergency paid sick leave back. Um, And then after those two weeks, you are eligible for 10 weeks of paid leave at two thirds the normal rate. One way that this is a little more inclusive than, say, regular FMLA is this is uh, available to any employee who's worked at an employer for 30 days or more. That prompted me to think of another question or just maybe a clarification is that the only reason you can take this additional 10 weeks of expanded FMLA leave is if it is for this unavailable childcare, unavailable school because of COVID. So it has to be COVID related. So if I'm somebody who just can't get a babysitter this week, then I'm probably not eligible, right? Right. It would need to be that the place that the child would normally be receiving care if it's closed due to COVID, then you're going to qualify for this additional expanded medical leave. Right. Because I know there are a lot of schools that are still doing the, the remote schooling and that puts an additional burden on the parents who are having to be home with those kids and supervise them and try to help them through their schoolwork. God forbid. I'm so glad I don't have to do that. I, um, and I, and I feel so bad for these parents because it's, it's such a burden to try to juggle, you know, work and really kind of tutoring your child rather than being able to send them to school. So, so hopefully yeah. some relief for, for those folks. And, you know, we continue to encourage employees to talk with employers and hopefully, you know, employers are going to, you know, be understanding of, of the position that parents have been put in. Cause I don't think it's an enviable position. Um, and I, and I don't think most people would choose to have it be this way if they had a choice. So I, I hope employers are going to try to use some understanding and be cooperative. Like everybody really along the way is, has urged them to do. I think, you know, we're looking at it, it's a different workplace and we don't know how long it's going to be like this. We don't know what changes are going to be permanent. So it's hard to say, but you always hope that an employer is going to want to work with their employees. Of course, we wouldn't be in this line of business if they always did. (laughs) That's true. One thing that I noticed the other day, and this is sort of a curveball, but one thing I noticed the other day was, let's say that your, your kid is learning remotely, the school's closed, or maybe there's a hybrid actually is a better, it's a better example to say there's a hybrid. Mm -hmm. And at some point, the kid has a runny nose and the school wants them to stay out until they get tested. So they stay out, they're negative, they can come back to school. And now, you know, who knows that could happen again in two more weeks. And so I just sort of envision this merry-go-round of these frantic parents trying to you know, figure out how they're going to juggle when there's, when nothing is constant anymore, everything is in flux. On this expanded FMLA, parents can use that intermittently, right? What are the conditions of that? They can use it intermittently for the days that that school or daycare is closed due to COVID. So if they're, you know, if it's remote learning um, a couple days a week and a couple days of in-class, and they can use it for the days that the school's actually closed 
for attendance. Right. And has that changed? I mean, I think initially it said it had to be by agreement of the employer, but now they've revised that to say that no, if the school is actually closed for whatever reason, or even if it's a, a hybrid schedule, it's going to be considered closed on the days your child cannot or is prevented from being there in person for whatever reason. Yeah, that was my understanding is that at this point, if the child is not able to attend or is prevented from attending, then on those specific days, um, this type of leave can apply. I know that's at least some relief for um, for the merry-go-round. We've talked about the pay and we've talked about the large employers. We've talked a little bit about the small employers. We'll revisit that for a second. And then I also want to want to touch on who else the FFCRA may not apply to, because I think that's that covers quite a few people. But let's get back to the small business exemption for a second. We know that it's only if it's a child care issue because of COVID. And we know that it's only if the business is under 50 people. But we also know that that's not all that there has to be. So what does the employer right. have to do to be able to claim that exemption beyond just meeting those two requirements? And so if it's an employer that's under 50 people and the request is for child or school care, um, then the business also has to show that basically that this leave is going to cause this business almost to go out of business. It's, it's going to cause a hardship on the business. Mm-hmm. And so um, there's three different ways it's categorized. Um, one, that it would result in expenses and obligations um, that would be beyond the ability of the business to actually cover to that the employee's absence would be a substantial risk to the health or operations of the, the business, or three, that you overall have not enough employees that are able, willing to work. So the, the idea, I think, is that you have this company that's very small and someone needs time off to care for their kids, but everybody is not available or everybody's out and they've literally got nobody to run the business. And those right. sort of extreme cases, then they're going to be in a place where they can claim an exemption. But one thing to note is that this is an exemption that the employer can raise and and that the employer can claim. So if the employer is wrong, then they're also going to be liable for that error. Yeah, and that's kind of risky business, right? Which is another reason to sort of be cooperative with your employees and make sure that, you know, everybody's on the same page. It's interesting to me that I can sort of see where, you know, you'd want to protect the employers just a little bit for this 10 week spread, because basically everybody has children and everybody's children may have a need to educate at home. Right. So I get that, that for 10 weeks, doing without your employees for 10 weeks is a lot for a small business. I'm a little bit more confused that they can take this exemption just for the two weeks of paid sick leave, you know, for the the childcare issue. But, you know, but that's what it is. And, and I think it's important to also talk about the fact or highlight the fact that these employers don't have to bear this burden themselves. I mean, don't they get a dollar for dollar tax credit for the, for the pay that they're having to shuck out under CRA? Absolutely. And I think, you know, whenever you read, um, so DOL guidance on how to implement this, you'll see that they are strongly encouraging employers to try to work with employees and not necessarily claim these exemptions. And one of the things that they do point out is, you know, you're getting a benefit, right? So it's, it's not completely on you. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's interesting to me. I, it's a struggle, right? I mean, because you're a small business and, you know, if you have to do without key people, then certainly that should be something you can get an exemption for. But what we're seeing, I think a lot of our intake calls are that businesses some employers believe that if you're under 50, you can just blow this off and that you don't have to meet the standards. So I know they don't have to, you know, mail in any paperwork. And I think, in fact, the Department of Labor has asked them not to do that. But what I'm hearing defense employers advise their clients who are businesses is that really you need to be able to document this. And if you can't document it, then you're really, as you said earlier, setting yourself up to risk lawsuit and you know, additional damages far above what you would have had to pay the employee to begin with if you had just, you know, done it the right way. Right. I mean, they are subject to liquidated damages. So, you know, double the pay that the employee would have had. And I've seen cases where an employer fired somebody in violation of this act, hired somebody new, and then had to go back and pay the damages on the person they fired. So at that point, you're paying somebody twice, right, for the same hours. Um, You're paying a new person and the liquidated on top of it. So, 
it's a gamble. I think that, you know, it's a new law. And every time we have a new law go into effect, it takes a while for everyone to become aware and get their hands around it. And so you're going to see employers make judgment calls that might not always be the best. Um, and I think that's also why it's so important to reach out to attorneys and, and go online and, and talk to folks and see if your rights are being infringed. Yeah, because sometimes all it kind of takes is a word from us for the employer to kind of snap to. And so, you know, that, again, is another good reason to call us because it's, it's, it's free to call us. You can talk with an attorney for 20 minutes, go over your case and let them advise you about what your next best steps are. Exactly. Are there any other exemptions or exceptions to who gets the benefit of FCRA? I know there are some pretty large groups that I've read about that do not get the benefit of this. And who, who who are those folks? It's healthcare workers is is the large part of it. And the, the definition of healthcare workers is fairly specific. And so those folks aren't going to be able to claim the uh, FFCRA protections. Um, And that also, well, I I guess it's a separate category, but also emergency responders. Those are two categories. This is the specific definition that's set forth because that's a term that I have seen used very loosely by employers. And the definition is actually in the statute. Anyone employed at any doctor's office, hospital, healthcare center, clinic, post-secondary educational institution offering healthcare instruction, medical, school, local health department or agency, nursing facility, retirement facility, nursing home, home health provider, or any facility that performs laboratory, medical testing, pharmacy, or any similar institution, employer, or entity. And so what I'm saying there is if, if you think you might fall in this category, it's probably worth making sure that your employment actually does fall into one of these enumerated categories. Yeah. And I was see. really kind of surprised to learn that that dentists were not, or at last glance for me, dentists were not part of the healthcare provider group. And I kind of get that, but in another way, I kind of don't because those are still healthcare providers. But so far, I think they are covered under FFCRA, as far as I know. Have you seen anything different on that? I haven't seen anything different. I mean, this last language here is as any similar institution. I get the sense that this exemption, though, is really meant to target the folks who are out in the front lines treating COVID, right? Because we, we need those people, those sort of frontline responders and dentists aren't necessarily, I think, in that same category, but that's just me. I kind of get it. I mean, yeah. The other thing I think might be interesting and, and a lot of the questions we also get from people are, well, you know, I've been with the company for more than a year and the company is more than 50 employees. So I'm eligible for regular FMLA. And, you know, I took 12 weeks last year off and on because of my, you know, whatever health condition they may have or care of another person. Does this mean I get 12 more weeks of FMLA for, you know, my child's school closure or, or am I limited? It's best to think of it as a new reason to take FMLA. It's not additional FMLA. So if you've already taken your 12 weeks, then you're going to be in a tough spot because it's not providing additional leave. And I do think that might be a problem for folks, especially if it turns out this virus is something that you can catch more than once, or if it comes back, or if you have multiple individuals in your family who come down with it. I mean, there are definitely limits here that could be sort of tough to navigate, but overall you're, you're only going to be able to take 12 weeks in the year total. Yeah. It's kind of hard to know what the solution is going to be when you don't know what the full scope of the problem is going to be. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> As I said, when we started, this is going to be a two-part series. And I know, you know, we've covered a lot of ground so far. We still have some ground to cover and we want to get into talking about the Americans with Disabilities Act. Did you have anything else that you think we should touch on in this first part of the show that listeners may want to know about? Folks are concerned about whether or not employers can require them to be tested for COVID before they return to the workplace. And I think there was some confusion about that. The EEOC did issue guidance that said that it can be acceptable for an employer to require that. So that's not necessarily unlawful. Mm -hmm. It just needs to be job related and consistent with business necessity. And the other thing I would note is that the results of those tests, like if they're taking temperature tests or any type of tests, still need to be maintained in a very confidential manner. So if you're being asked to do that to return to work, it can be within the bounds of the law um, if if it's following those standards. You know, that brings to to my mind the kind of testing, because it's one thing to just temperature test um, with a with a touch free thermometer. Right. But it's a very different thing when you start running 
COVID tests or having your employees go for COVID tests, which you hope would just be a swab. But there's a really fine line to me, you know, where, where do you draw the line on testing? Because if you get into the antibody testing or you get into any testing that can look even remotely like genetic testing, then the employer could be breaking, you know, other laws. I know we had a, a huge genetic testing case several years ago and that's some very dicey area to get into. So I think employers need to be careful. And I think too, if employees think that your employer is crossing the line as to what kind of testing and what they're testing for, that might be another reason to call us. I think that, yeah, the antibody testing definitely would be problematic. So yeah, if people have concerns, I think now is a really scary time for folks who are having to return to work or maybe folks who have taken this leap so far and are now having to return. I think that this is a very serious threat and it's right for people to take it seriously and they should definitely call us or reach out to to us or to the DOL or or, or to whoever and and get some guidance and make sure that they're being treated safely and lawfully. Agreed. Well, thank you, Adian, for joining me today to talk about this. Let's continue the conversation in part two, uh, which we'll push out later this month. So everybody stay tuned for that. If you're an employee and you have questions about your workplace rights, questions about anything we've talked about today or anything else that's bugging you about what's going on at work, please reach out to us at Barry and Farahani. You can reach our attorneys at 404-487-0909. We represent employees exclusively, and we are the only firm I know of that provides a complimentary 20-minute consultation directly with an attorney. You can also go on our website at justiceatwork.com and self-schedule an appointment to, to talk with one of our attorneys.